Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the one o'clock clock. Uh, and we're talking about global connections with Carlos Suarez, who joins us from uh, Mexico or near Mexico City. Let me say that. Yeah. Hi, Carlos. Aloha, Jay. Very good to connect. And uh, of course, this is now the new normal. We all have to stay home. And fortunately, uh, Think Tech has been ahead of the game. We've been doing this for years now. And uh, despite the, all the changes happening in these last days with this uh, coronavirus, uh, we're, we're, we are to continue a dialogue and, and, and you know, obviously share information, keep our uh, audience informed, uh, raising public awareness, as you say. So yes, sir. Uh, the show must go on. <laughs> yes, sir. And remote is the word of the day. And we connect more and more yeah. with people remotely in various places in the world. It doesn't matter across mm -hmm. the street or across the world. So it's, it's yes. always great to talk to you, Carlos, especially now because you're in the International Relations Department there. And, um, and, and we have international relations on the block today after Donald mm -hmm. Trump's uh, remarks about coronavirus yesterday. Aside from all the mm -hmm. other gaffes and footfalls uh, that he has shown us uh, in the past few days, a complete and total lack of leadership and honesty, um, we now mm -hmm. have a, uh, a, a huge... Um, assault on international relations uh, in the form of uh, shutting down all passenger traffic, uh, non-U.S. citizen and permanent resident passenger traffic coming from Europe. Uh, can you mm -hmm. talk about what happened and um, how, it, how it is evolving? Well, it is evolving so quickly, literally you know, by the hour and, and day in these last days uh, and so it's a very important thing for us to be both, uh, you know, stay informed, talk about these things, share, you know, uh, make sure we separate reality and things that we know and don't know. But essentially, last night we had a rare uh, opportunity to see the president speak to us from the White House, give a press conference, uh, literally where he was reading a script, uh, something he used to criticize a lot before. Uh, but in a moment like this, we have a complex emergency, a public health crisis, but obviously something that is impacting the global economy in dramatic ways. It's a time where, you know, you need crisis management, crisis communication, uh, and especially on something like this, uh, a pandemic. Uh, we've known, we've had some before, and, and we will continue to face these in the future. This is where you need a time for really the experts to help give us the, the facts, the information, you know, the, the medical professionals, the, the scientists, um, and, you know, the U.S. has them, but we had a lot of bumbling efforts, you know, and, and the president sending a lot of mixed signals of maybe, you know, over, over um, uh, emphasizing maybe that this was going to be gone before long. And, uh, you know, a growing uh, sort of silent uh, criticism from behind. Uh, moreover, uh, we, we see different reaction in, uh, in other places where some of the political leaders have taken very quick and decisive action, whether South Korea, of course, Italy locking down. Now it's come to the U.S. in a way that, it, you know, we're told very clearly this uh, this leader of the of the uh, division of the CDC, uh, his name escapes me right now, but he's been there since 1986, a remarkable individual. Um, he was testifying before the Congress a few days ago. And the bottom line, it's going to get worse. It's going to get very bad before it gets better. So how do we handle it? Are we prepared? And here, the role of a leader is to both allay our concerns, assure us that, yes, the experts are on it, but not send mixed signals. And particularly the leader of the United States, uh, our president is always a global leader, uh, and now the, 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 the speech he gave yesterday that left a lot of confusion, but also a bit of anger, uh, specifically from our European allies. Uh, and I say allies because, of course, today with Trump, there's a lot of tension and animosity. Traditionally, throughout the last, what, 70, 80 years now, uh, World War II, uh, Western Europe uh, and the United States have had always a very uh, close uh, working relationship of trust, uh, maybe disagreements, but certainly respect and, and, and cooperation and coordination. Today, we don't see that. We see the Europeans very much denouncing uh, what, what effectively is, a, you know, in some ways his, his speech was like blaming it on them as if they were the source of this issue. Uh, and that's not what you do in a well, moment like this. that's what he said. That's but what also, he said in so many Yeah, words. he did. He did. Ex basically, that we've done more than they. Well, not quite. And frankly, you can imagine a small country like Denmark, just to pick out a hat. I mean, it's a country that has obviously capacity and, and expertise. And, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing right now. But let me say... I'm sure they have a handle on it and they're not, you know, their leader, whoever it is, is not going to be sending confusing mixed signals. Uh, so this uh, press conference, very important to have it because he needs to convey to the nation and that's he doesn't the role have of a leader. a lot of press conferences. Very few uh, no, press No, exactly. 
well, they're pretty much gone now. It's the it's the chopper yeah. talk that we see on his way out of uh, the Rose Garden. But um, essentially, you know, it, it left again both uh, confusion and I I took the effort to actually listen to it. And my first thing, because he literally said, uh, not only is it going to stop traffic from Europe, but he did make reference to you know commerce and trade. And when I heard that, I thought, what? How can you possibly stop for? You know, and then he had to send out a tweet and say, no, 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 it's only people. Well, you know, get your facts right. And if you're going to deliver a speech, make sure somebody has proofread it and you know exactly the important points to make. Keep it short, keep it brief, but clear. Uh, he had to then go and clarify. But also, this is not the time to somehow point fingers and blame and, and call it a foreign virus. You know, some of the language also is, is something that attracts a lot of, you know, concern because, uh, the, you know, pandemics don't have... Uh, they don't have passports. They don't have identities. Uh, they, you know, in this globalized world, they're going to be there, and they're here now, everywhere. Uh, and so we need to coordinate. We need to cooperate. We need to work together. Uh, and um, you know, I think we're seeing some of the results of this more bumbling effort uh, on the part of our leader. Um, and it reflects again his lack of understanding. I think he gave a t talk a few days ago, bragging about his uncle, a professor at MIT. Well, let's hear from his uncle if he's a professor. What does he have to say? Well, he may not be alive anymore, but the point is, how can he take credit for somebody in his past who, who was an expert scientist or whatever? Uh, we, need, we need the real experts to be giving us briefings and information here. Uh, and the political leaders have a role to kind of step back and let them do it. Their role needs to be empathy. It needs to be reassurance. Unfortunately for Trump, uh, his history of you know half-truths, hyperbole, and outright lies means many people, a good half of the population is going to be very skeptical about him. And, and the world community too. I mean, the Europeans clearly uh, know that he is very weak in his understanding of issues and knowledge and history. And it's all about him, about you know his, how it'll affect his own personal political agenda. So uh, that's not a time to, to make this into that. Well, the context uh, for me is that when he first took office, he started attacking the EU. He started complaining that uh, they weren't bearing their fair share of defense costs and, um, and EU expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, he alienated every single country in Europe that were our allies from way back when. And, uh, you know, over mm -hmm. time, uh, he has not improved on that. He has had gaffes and missteps all along the way, three and a half years now. Um, and I mm -hmm. would imagine, uh, you, you're probably closer to this than me, I would imagine that the average European thinks he's an idiot. And the average European leader thinks he's a moron. Uh, you know, so what, you know, what is what is the European view of him now, even before his remarks yesterday? Well, again, yeah, they, I mean, they've seen him on the stage and whenever he's come to meetings there, whether the NATO or the, you know, the Davos meetings in, in, uh, in Switzerland or uh, the G20, G7, whatever, it, it, he's uncomfortable. He's awkward. He is not a president who uh, supports multilateralism. Now, that doesn't make him unique. We've had over the years different trends. And, and in general, when we look at U.S. foreign policy, the role of the U.S. in the world, there's always a tug and, and push and pull of internationalism versus isolationism, different variations. Today, we are seeing a sort of a version of neo-isolationism, uh, Trump's policy, America first. I mean, there's a rationale for it. Yes, take care of your homeland, take care of your people. But to do it in a way that disregards very long, long-standing you know, personal ties and, and, and commitments, uh, you know, the presence of the U.S., why we have military bases in Europe or in South Korea. Uh, this, there's a context there, and it's not all about money and transactions. Trump does see the world, and we describe his foreign policy as transaction-oriented. How much is it costing us? What, what are we getting out of it? Uh, and so he'll, he'll, you know, argue with the NATO allies, and it's all about what they're paying. Now, you know, there, there's a place for that, but there's also a need to recognize that the alliance is there for a purpose, for a reason, and it fosters cooperation, coordination, frankly, to address emergencies like this. Uh, the more you understand how others work, you, you have a, you know, lines of communication that are open, consultation. But we have seen a, a pretty sharp break with this uh, presidency, uh, sort of giving up that, a, a long, long-standing tradition of multilateralism and maybe just you know, co cooperation. And, and I think the Europeans were very stung by the announcement because it came, you know, blindsided them. And so for many, it was, uh, it, you know, they have denounced it, uh, especially, uh, you know, the, the part in which he's essentially blaming the Europeans for this. That's neither correct, nor is it the right thing to do if it was. Uh, so it, it, this further, you know, it just reinforces yes, exactly. a strong, it's a strong view. It's a continuation of the same isolationist uh, policy mm -hmm. where he doesn't care about them or care about their reactions to his uh, mac mm -hmm. mac machinations 
But, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, this is a hard question, uh, but you might be able to help me with this. You know, mm-hmm. the, the world order has changed and is changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we started off after World War uh, II with the Marshall Plan. We high credibility. Mm-hmm. We saved the world for sure. democracy, the whole world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, people mm-hmm. threw roses at us everywhere we went. Um, mm-hmm. And o- over time, I think we blemished that a little bit. But but I think we were fine, in my view anyway, until Trump got here. And then Trump began to mm-hmm. rip it up. So, what you know, what's happened mm-hmm. now is different. It's unprecedented, at least since the war. Mm-hmm. And I wonder what your thoughts are on not only American leadership, but American leadership for the world order and what it means mm-hmm. to lose the world order that we had. Yeah, well, you know, a couple of things here real quick. I, I think we, we, we've got to recognize that, yeah, the world is changing. And, and for Americans to understand it is not the world of, you know, early post-Cold War, even the second half of the 20th century where American leadership was unquestioned. And it was even, you know, despite differences, it was understood that the U.S. was leading a, a, an alliance of, you know, liberal democracies, open free trade, et cetera. Um, let me say this, though, that, you know, the decline of American influence or leadership, it has begun long before Trump. And, and maybe it reflects, you know, Fareed Zakaria, the talking head on CNN. Uh, he published a book some years ago that's a classic called The Post-America World. And it really speaks to the relative decline of the U.S., not only because, um, well, the U.S. is no longer calling shots, but mainly he argues the rise of the rest. You know, China is a big player now, India, an emerging market and, and player, uh, Russia redefining. So the world out there is changing, becoming more relevant, and the U.S. is kind of muddling along, but no longer calling the shots like it once did. And, you know, I want to share with you a couple of books that, uh, you know, I, I teach courses here on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and helping understand the role of the U.S. in the world. It's a changing world. Uh, and um, and they reflect, again, some of the talks. Uh, this is a book, a classic one, oh, some six, seven years ago, Henry Kissinger published on World Order. Of course, he's this, you know, classic strategic thinker, uh, uh, very much, you know, power politics, uh, the world of real politique. And we do still see that, patterns of these enduring geopolitical conflicts, the U.S. and China, Russia and its role, the EU now as a new player. So understanding these sort of broad trends. And, and and so Kissinger helped provide a foundation for that, a pretty good overview in general. Uh, but more to the point, what we see, a number of books in these last few years, uh, uh, examples, uh, Stephen Walt, a professor at, at Harvard, he's got a book called The Hell of Good Intentions, the subtitle, Americans, Foreign Policy Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy. Uh, so again, reflecting this trend, uh, another book, and I, I, I find this one quite valuable, uh, Richard Haas, who's uh, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was in the mainly, the I think, the Bush One administration, head of the policy planning, planning staff. Uh, and his book is A World in Disarray, American Foreign Policy and the Crisis of the Old Order. The order has changed. The U.S. has to be a little more humble and realistic. It, it should have a leadership role, maybe not the dominant uh, calling the shots like we used to, but it should be at the table working in concert with the others. Today, we see a, a decline in that. Uh, and maybe, uh, again, another book, these are a couple of, uh, they were staffers in the National Security Council for Obama, uh, Ivo Dalder and James uh, Lindsay, The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. And of course, Trump has accelerated that. But let me just say this, uh, we have seen this happening, uh, decline in US influence for some time now, since the 90s, accelerated events. But now, under Trump, super accelerated so that he is literally completely, you know, left, uh, you know, no interest in it. And not only that, again, his own background as an individual, he didn't come to the office with foreign policy experience. But more than that, he's not interested in the history. He doesn't know, you know, the importance of diplomacy or recognize it. And in the end, we have a world where we have shared global challenges. A pandemic crises like this are a good example. You need leaders who have trust, who, uh, who, who, who share information and rather than, you know, trying to blame and uh, otherwise not coordinate, not consult, this, you know, this can only come back to bite us in time. Uh, yeah, you need your friends, that. you know, at, at, you, you, in moments of crisis, you need your friends uh, and, and, and even your, you know, adversaries to be there uh, to work with because, um, you know, again, pandemics, uh, these are not things that are going to stop at the border and, they, and they're not interested in politics. They're, they're, they're science. It's, it's a disease. Uh, let me add maybe one last book. Uh, you may know, of course, he's been in the news with the, with the uh, uh, recent Me Too movement, Ronan Farrow, the son of Mia Farrow and Woody Allen. Uh, mm-hmm. He published a book a few years ago called War on Peace, The End of Diplomacy and the Decline of 
American influence. Uh, he himself has got a curious story. He came in as a young, young, you know, 20 year old working as a State Department uh, consultant with Richard Holbrook, former ambassador who passed away a few years ago. And he got insights into really the decline of American influence, really the destruction of diplomacy, which again, under Trump has just been, you know, decimated now. Uh, so our foreign policy establishment is in a real crisis. And, uh, you know, it'll take some time to repair. It'll take some time before the U.S. returns. Uh, it will never be what it was, you know, immediately post-World War II. We have to recognize that. But it should be as a responsible player at the table. And, and, and right now, I think the Europeans are riding it out, maybe hoping that he doesn't continue after this next election. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just say again, it also reflects the waves that we have. We have t tendencies. You look at Bush one. He was a multilateral... Uh, you know, he, he fought the first Pers Persian Gulf War with a broad coalition, a UN yes. resolution. Um, he would be followed by Clinton, also a multilateralist, but in the early post-Cold War period, Clinton kind of wanting to maybe come back home and, and focus on domestic policy, understandably. Uh, and in the end of that Cold War, the early years were very exciting. You know, hey, the, you know, the end of history. Well, that didn't last us long. We began to see new threats, uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, ethnic violence. And the U.S. still figuring out, you know, what is its role working in concert with Europeans. Uh, we then come to the Bush II, and he represents, again, a swing towards the unilateralism. Unlike his father, didn't build uh, the international support for the very, very controversial and, and tragic intervention in Iraq overthrowing uh, the government. Um, we get back to Obama, and he represents, again, the, the swing towards multilateralism. Of course, he was like a rock star in Europe, but in part because he... He, he knew how to work closely with them, how to empathize. And, and, you know, the basic skills of international diplomacy, international negotiation, you have to be respectful of the other side. You have to understand their interests. You may not like them. You may not agree. But you need to respect them. And you need to know that something is important to them, just as you would want them to understand your interests. Uh, we don't see that in the, in the president today. So Trump represents a break from the past. Yes, it's a shift to unilateralism and, and you know, sort of a hyper-nationalism, but it's even more than that. It's, it's this bullying and, and sort of, a, uh, you know, we have a, a concept of American exceptionalism that's very prominent throughout our history. Uh, and it's a view that, well, we've got special qualities we, we, we bring to the world. We have a certain almost moral imperative to help. Uh, but hard to how make can that, that be case taken seriously. Days, yeah, yeah. No, how can you reconcile that? So you know what? Yeah, what when, I get, when what you I don't get from it. this is that we have lost uh, the ability to do, or the, the the idea of doing diplomacy. And diplomacy is the mm -hmm. is the lubricant, if you will, in, in uh, national yes. international relations. Um, and then we sure. have you know, and what you described, the lack of uh, the, the loss of influence. It's not only Europe; it's mm -hmm. everywhere, especially you know, <laughs> recently in Asia as well. So our relations are different everywhere. But here's what I mm -hmm. uh, here's what I like to follow up with, Carlos. <clears throat> so he doesn't even want a seat at the table. He wants to turn his back mm -hmm. and once in a while get involved mm -hmm. and be a bully uh, and everybody kiss his ring. Um, but the fact mm -hmm. is he doesn't want to make any, any contribution um, to the effort of, of international global cooperation. What yeah. is a world like that? When you create the vacuum, as one of those books portrayed it, you know, a vacuum in leadership. Mm -hmm. leadership. And, and when you have uh, so our former allies are all ticked off at us and resent us for so many things. Uh, what is that world like? And, and now maybe it's yeah. too early to say, because this speech was, you know, the capper on things. It was only yesterday. Yeah. Um, but going forward, sure. we're going to see we're going to see reactions. We're going to see reactions yeah. from the nations in Europe. We're going to see people sort of get on board about you know, calling our bluff on these things. We're going to see people yeah. find out that we don't have testing for the coronavirus. You know, Korea yeah. is doing, you know, a hundred times better, a hundred, maybe a thousand times better than we're doing on, on testing. Mm -hmm. we're, we have completely failed. And yet he says, oh, we have tests for everybody. Not true. It's a big yeah. lie. And it will be found out and it will be observed by other nations. So my question is, yeah. when everybody realizes that the emperor is not wearing clothing, what is the world order then? Yeah. What is what is yeah. the table look like at that time? Yeah. Well, it is, it is, uh, and I got one more book to share with you. I think this answers it for us. Uh, the title of this is Chaos in the Liberal Order. You know, we have had this liberal international order uh, established after World War II uh, and very much integrating the world. 
uh, today it's uncertainty, and I think um, it's going to be a heavy price. It'll be difficult for the U.S. to regain. It will never quite go back to where it was, but let's hope that in time and some future leadership, it can at least foster, you know, a return to a working relationship. Uh, today, obviously, we have gained a lot of uh, distrust, a lot of animosity. And so what does that mean, or what are the effects of that? I think increasingly you're going to see many leaders, let's say in Europe, that traditionally work with us, they're going to be reluctant to share information. They're going to be, you know, concerned about including us in the loop because uh, they don't uh, they don't trust uh, uh, the current leadership. Now, I want to say, and, and and I hope this is the case, that you know, leaders and maybe uh, intellectuals, elites, uh, and even average people often can separate someone like this leader uh, at the moment that we have and the American people, culture, society, uh, or even again, even in Europe, although they're the dying, aging generation, those who know the story that the U.S. had played such a critical role, rebuilding, helping uh, the European, even those in, in the post-communist Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, the U.S. was very important in, in, in helping pull them away from the Soviet uh, sphere. Uh, so this older generation, it's there. Unfortunately, the younger population, people under 30 today, don't know their history, don't read their history. And so uh, many, let's say, young Europeans today don't see the U.S. as having had any positive role in their lives. Instead, uh, you know, maybe they saw Obama, he was popular, but now what they see in Trump reflects the ugly American in a very, very visible way. That's too so, bad because uh, I think Americans it, yeah. are really not ugly at all. And uh, unfortunately, that's not the message <laughs> getting through and that, that's going to paint yes. us anyway. You know, it's very interesting that, um, you know, in this whole contention between state and federal, when the federal does nothing and it has done nothing, uh, you yeah. know, essentially over the past three and a half years on so many, so many issues, then the states take mm -hmm. up the mantle. The sure. states begin to yeah. do things. And that's happening now with, yeah. uh, with the coronavirus. Yeah. The states are Absolutely. becoming more active and they are, you know, like ignoring, mm -hmm. you know, the federal influence on the yeah. issue because the federal is not doing anything. Yeah. And Trump is running and Absolutely. making mistakes every day. So the, the same process, yeah. don't you think, uh, will happen? I think mm -hmm. you alluded to this uh, on an international level. Uh, they'll turn their backs mm -hmm. on us. They'll they'll solve the problem without us. And we lose further credibility because we weren't there. Mm -hmm. We weren't contributing. Uh, we weren't even nice to them. And uh, we become mm -hmm. a marginalized country in the world in the world community. Isn't that happening? Absolutely. No, it is very much uh, the, the world we're in now. I think a growing distrust and, and, and frustration. Now, that's with most. You have a handful, you know, the, the you know, Viktor Orban, the leader of Hungary, who is a very close, uh, you know, uh, populist, you know, right wing leader there, uh, close uh, affinity with Trump and, and maybe the, the current leaders in Poland as, a, as an example. But in general, the, the key leadership, France, Germany, even the UK, uh, and even despite uh, Boris Johnson and his, you know, uh, bromance with uh, with Trump, I think he's f facing a, a delicate situation there as they try to transition to a post-EU world. The U.S. is not going to be able to save their butts entirely, and 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 I think the U.K. is going to be continuing well, to muddle through. Trump, How uh, why did Trump exclude the U.K. from his edict, mm. his ill-advised yeah, edict it, yesterday? What was the reason for that? What could be the well, reason for the, that? There is a reason, and the short one is that basically the European Union has what's known as the Schengen Zone, the Schengen region, which are the outer borders of the European Union. Now, the UK was never part of that. It, because it's physically separate, they always kind of controlled more access in and out, uh, and that pushed, in fact, one of the reasons that it was pushing for Brexit, they wanted even more control. But effectively, the Schengen Zone, as it's called, refers to the now 27 remaining nations that are uh, of the EU, and that does not include the uh, you know, UK or even the Republic of Ireland, which is a part of the EU. So actually, in fact, it's 26 nations. Let me correct that. There are 27 remaining today in the EU, but the Republic of Ireland, physically apart from you know the mainland, uh, is not part of this. So it is the Schengen zone, as it's called, uh, because there, effectively, this is the outer limits of the European Union where they control the outer borders. Access is more tight if you're coming in to Spain from Morocco than if you're going from you know Denmark to Sweden, uh, the borders are wide open. So uh, at first when I heard that too, and I oh it doesn't include the UK, my first thought was oh giving our special you know relationship like a you know like throwing them a bone. Not quite, although that was my first answer too. I thought oh my gosh, you know this is just you know you're trying to throw something to Boris. In fact, it has to do with this reality of the Schengen zone of the European Union where they control the outer borders. Uh, but again, ill-advised. You know, you know uh, the some, UK has cases too. Him. 
Uh, you remember of only course, a few days course. ago, the Minister of Health of the UK announced yes, that yes. he had the infection. So I, you know, I don't That's see right. any reason medically to, um, you know, to, to distinguish between the UK and the rest mm -hmm. of the and the EU. What's worse is yeah. that there are people, there are medical professionals who have said in response to his comments yet to Trump's comments yesterday that there's this no is make it worse. reason. There's no medical reason to no. cut off Europe this way. But there's no nobody yeah, has. Yeah. There's not evidence based. It's not medical evidence based. What is it? No, it's just no. maybe it's playing to yeah. his base. Um, maybe it's uh, sure, just being yeah. a bully. But one more question before it, we close, yeah. Carlos. Yeah. And, and that is mm -hmm. this. <clears throat> you know, you mentioned a couple of times in this discussion that maybe the U.S. has the possibility of coming back. And maybe if, uh, you know, somebody else, hopefully not would, somebody else is elected president in November and that person is properly seated and that person sits in the Oval Office and, and would like to make decisions to resurrect our formerly positive relationship with Europe and other places in the world. Um, is that possible? You said it's going to take a long time. Yeah. But let me, yeah. let me ask you, what needs to be done? I, I make you the next president, Carlos. Uh, what would you do to resurrect mm -hmm. our formerly positive relationship mm -hmm. with all yeah. of these countries? Yeah. It, again, no simple answer, but it, it's going to take some humility, but it's going to take engagement. You have to be there, be present. You have to listen to them, too, and not come with an attitude, you know, out in the past and, and often from outside. Uh, the U.S. is a bully. It always has been. Uh, and certainly, you know, here I am in Mexico, in, in, South, in Latin America, uh, there's a long history of that, a very asymmetrical relationship. But I think this is a challenge for the United States. Uh, it will no longer be the dominant, uh, you know, calling all the shots that it did in, in especially the early post-war period. Uh, but it needs to be at the table. It needs to be working. With it. So it's going to require rebuilding trust. I mean, it's like a broken relationship. You, you, you've got to show by your actions. You've got to show by you know, a little humility. Uh, and that's not always easy. Uh, uh, Americans, we like to boast, you know, we're number one, we're number one. But uh, that uh, sense of American exceptionalism is also viewed with a lot of skepticism by others. And I think we've eroded a lot of that trust. So it's not going to come easily. It does have to happen and it will gradually improve. And, and I think ultimately, once you get people back in government who are more engaging, more, uh, let's say, uh, empathetic and, and, and open communication. We don't have that today. There's not much dialogue happening and it's a very, you know, aggressive uh, approach from our current leadership uh, and that, that has set us back many years. You know, uh, you know we can so patch it's a it challenge, uh, but, but uh, you know, yeah. whoever wins it, for president can patch it up. Vice president can be more active. A, a good secretary of state would help and we can work hard yeah. over the next, uh, you know, administration to patch it up. But I think sure. one thing is clear from this mm -hmm. discussion, Carlos, it's never going to be the same, right? No, no. This is a game changer. I think the world as we know it is going to be very different as we move forward. And, uh, you know, and, and how this is playing out, again, we're seeing continued bumbling and, 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 and just very, uh, uh, you know, not very effective leadership from the U.S. side. That's going to continue to erode our image in the world and, and particularly with our traditional allies in Europe. Those are today uh, the ones that are just shaking their heads like, uh, here we go again. And it's just taking us several steps back. So well, unfortunately, we, we've got a crisis. And that's we're in the Absolutely. crisis. We cannot forget. We spent half an hour now. The two of us are going to go wash our hands. And uh, all I can say is that the crisis pervades. And I hope that everything mm. is good when we speak to you next time, Carlos. Uh, yes, stay healthy. Course. Keep washing your hands. And uh, all, all horizontal and vertical surfaces. Thank you so much, Carlos Suarez. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.